Good afternoon. <clears throat> Hope you can hear me. Good afternoon, students. This will be a brief video that is that is meant to summarize and clarify a few things from Chapter 3 for this week. Uh, chapter 3 gets into areas that are deeply intellectual and highly, <clears throat> highly sociological. Uh, that is not to say that it doesn't offer us some great insight into how advertising c uh, communicates in the holy hype perspective. In that regard, I have a few points I would like you to understand as they pertain to advertising principles today versus advertising of the early 20th century, uh, what we call the golden age of advertising. Uh, as we have already seen, Quaker Oats got out in front in the late 1880s promoting its pure product for healthy living. It didn't speak of how the cereal would make you feel. It promoted its purity uh, of ingredients, a feature of, of its cereal. It used a Quaker as its spokesperson because a Quaker was a symbol of good, healthy, and religious living and of trustworthiness. So whatever the Quaker man said to you or wrote in the uh, ad was uh, something you could count on. This was publicized in radio, early 1920s, and in print. The Quaker was our first modern-day spokesperson for the holy hype approach. He is actually uh, responsible for the modern introduction of holy hype. He's the first representative of holy hype that we see in modern days. In 1930, a man named Rosser Reeves came up with the concept of a unique selling proposition, or what we call a USP. Uh, the USP was, is, a statement or depiction of how a business will solve a customer's problems. It must be highly personalized to differentiate one's brand among the marketplace. Today, Nike must differentiate itself among other brands, such as Reebok. Adidas, New Balance, and more. Uh, what happens when all sneakers seem to have pretty much the same features? And this would apply to any product in the marketplace. Um, how many different toilet papers can there be? Well, there are a lot of them. How many features can they have? It begins to get difficult to differentiate them. Um, it becomes necessary for each brand to make you feel different from another brand. We tend to move away from the features and benefits and toward the emotions you have when you wear Nikes as opposed to how you feel when you wear Adidas. Um, the advertisers need to keep coming up with ways to demonstrate how they make you feel different and of course we know how Charmin makes you feel different. The family of bears lets you know that. Holy hype is an approach that takes advantage of how you feel about religion or religious symbols, sanctity, sacredness, or how you feel about what has come from religion. We'll be using words like authenticity when we begin to talk about how religion is used to sell beer, of all things. When beer and certain liqueurs were first sold to the masses, it was monks who made these products. If we can somehow create this mystique of the monastery along with an ale or liqueur, we can project authenticity. We begin to feel that the product has been made by people who really are like the first monks who produced it. We are now interested in not only how it makes us feel to drink, but how it makes us look to other people when we drink it. So what does this all have to do with the topic of whether advertising is a religion or not. Whether we subscribe to Jolly and Kavanaugh's beliefs that advertising is a religion or to Einstein and Sheffield's convictions that advertising is not a religion per se, but does share some dimensions of it, we can begin to see the connections and understand why holy hype works. The goal is to show the purpose of the product in the consumer's life. Uh, I may not be looking for salvation when I drink a beer, but I may be looking for some emotion or special satisfaction during and after the experience of drinking it. 
if we can believe or just think about the product being divine in some way, then perhaps we can justify paying twice as much for it, drinking it more often than perhaps we should, or devising special occasions for going out and drinking it with friends. And maybe it does something to that experience. Maybe it helps that experience along in some way. Frangelico is a hazelnut flavored liqueur that has built up a backstory that is what originally that it was um, originally produced by a certain 17th century monk. Uh, in reality, Frangelico was created in 1978. It costs approximately $30 per 750 milliliter bottle. The Kuiper hazelnut liqueur costs about $10 for the same size bottle. The company does not tell a story like Frangelico about its hazelnut liqueur. Its website states that although it began producing uh, liquor, liqueurs in 1911, it wasn't until the 1960s that its production of liqueurs overtook its production of Dutch gin. The site doesn't even tell us when it began to produce hazelnut liqueur. It has a whole line of liqueurs, all different flavors. When Frangelico came on the scene in 1978, its goal was to compete well against the De Kuiper product at three times the price and against all other hazelnut liqueurs. How could it do this? It decided to give its product an aura of authenticity and centuries-old knowledgeable craftsmanship in both its packaging and its advertising. Now, this is going to help you with your discussion questions for today. So I, I, want, I hope that you have listened to this. I hope that you have read the PowerPoint and um, and uh, read the, the chapter, or gotten into the chapter at least, the first half, is, which is what I want you to read by the end of today. Uh, so anyway, uh, get on with your day. Let's talk some more. I think you'll be surprised by what you'll find in the dis discussion space for today, and I look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you.